All right, everybody, let's talk about the oral hypoglycemic agents, which are uh, good to treat diabetes mellitus type 2. All right, in the last video, uh, in the last session, we discussed about the type, how to treat type 1 diabetes with insulin, and now we are talking how to treat type 2 diabetes with the oral glycemic agents, okay, hypoglycemic agents. So, uh, this is the chart which I have produced, not produced, which I have inserted here actually, okay, so that you will know what kind of medication is there and what kind of mechanism of action it has, okay. So, we are going to discuss about the sulfonyl ureas, then we'll discuss the bigonite, then we'll discuss thiazolidinone, okay, then we'll discuss the DPP4 inhibitors or GLP1 agonist, and then we'll discuss SGL2 inhibitor, and then, oh, wait a minute, we'll discuss the insulin and its analogs. All right, insulin and analogs, okay, all right. So, this is the one actually uh, I have produced for my presentation, okay, that uh, these are the medications. If you just want to memorize the drug's name, you can pause the video on this slide and uh, note down the entire chart in your notebook and you can memorize it, okay? All right. So, first of all, we'll discuss the secretogogic, which is the sulfonyl ureas and I'll tell you why do we call them secretogogous in a while. Secretogogous, as the name suggests, they are secreting insulin, right? Okay. So we have three generations of them, okay? The first generation includes solbutamide. Then we have uh, chlorpromide. Then we have acetohexamide. And then tolizamide. Uh, second generation is glibenamide then glipizide and then uh, glyclazide. In third generation, we have only uh, glimepiride. All right? Okay. So, talking about the sulfonyl uh, ureas and the structure. So, first generation compounds include these, which we talked. Second generation uh, compounds include these. So, they're up to 200 times more potent than the th first generation. Third generation include compounds, which is the glimepiride, may be used in conjunction with insulin. So these compounds may interact with different cellular proteins uh, than other sulfonyl ureas. All of the sulfonyl ureas are well absorbed after oral administration and bind to plasma proteins, notably albumin. Talking about the mechanism of action, before I talk about this slide, I want to take you here and I want you to discuss this slide with you, okay? All right. First of all, let's talk about what will happen if somebody has a low blood glucose level, okay, in the body. So if a low blood glucose, blood glucose level is there in the body, the first thing that is mentioned here, here is the ATP uh, will decrease. Now, why exactly ATP will be decreased? Okay. I'm sure you all must have studied in your biochemistry uh, that how exactly cellular respiration happens. I'm sure you have studied about uh, the, these all uh, cycles where glycolysis, citric acid cycle, and oxidative phosphorylation is happening. So anyways, as soon as glucose is uptaken by uh, the cell, okay, so as a result, what happens is uh, let's say this is right now we are dealing with the insulin producing cell which is the pancreatic beta cell okay okay so what happened is beta uh, glucose is being uptaken all right so when glucose is being uptaken as a result what will happen it will go through all of these cycles and if you know if aerobic respiration is happening somewhere okay so that cell is rich with which organism it is rich with mitochondria right uh, because all of these cycles happen within the mitochondria and because of aerobic cellular respiration 36 to 38 ATPs are produced okay so 
as a result you see right now i'm talking to you when a glucose level is high in the body okay and then a lot of atps are produced in the body okay so when a lot of atps are produced in the body it actually produces uh, an inhibitory effect on the potassium channels okay and as a result what will happen the atp gated channels will be closed uh, the atp gated potassium channels will be closed okay once they will shut down it will lead to depolarization of the cells okay and when a lot of uh, depolarization has happened so the calcium is actually triggered okay because if you remember i i don't i don't know if you have seen my other videos or not but the calcium is actually uh, uh, the calcium channel is voltage gated channel okay so what happens is as soon as the depolarization happens so at that moment the calcium channels also open up and because of them okay they they promote secretion of insulin from the beta pancreatic cells am i clear to you here okay so let's just say if somebody had low blood glucose levels so as a result they would have low amount of adps produced in their body the potassium would if plus would increase which means that the the gates won't be uh, closed and they would uh, go out more okay they would if if flux and because of that hyperpolarization would happen a lot of negativity could develop inside all right and when hyperpolarization would happen so it will decrease the calcium influx so obviously decrease insulin secretion okay and now we are talking about the opposite of it that the glucose is high in the body okay all right so let's study so mechanism of action sulfonylurea causes an increase in the amount of insulin secreted by the beta cells in response to a glucose challenge okay so sulfonylurea block potassium channels in beta cells leading to depolarization increased calcium entry via voltage dependent calcium channels and increased insulin secretion so these agents increase sensitivity to insulin perhaps by increasing the number of insulin receptors however sulfonylurea did not decrease the insulin requirements of patients with type 1 diabetes so sulfonylurea decrease serum glucagon which opposes the action of insulin okay all right so pharmacological properties pharmacological fa uh, pharmacologic failure with oral diabetic diabetic agents is common initially affecting 15 to 30 percent of patients and as many as 90 percent after six to seven years of therapy uh, then we have short acting agent so in that we have tolbutamide so short acting sulfonylurea are rapidly absorbed absorption is not affected if food is taken okay taken with the food as with all sulfonylurea hypoglycemia is potentially dangerous uh, side effect of these short acting agents others adver uh, other adverse effects include wait a minute it's hidden <laughs> okay so other adverse effects include dermatological disorders and gi disturbances including nausea and heartburn then we have the intermediate acting um, agents so in that we have acetohexamide so it is rapidly absorbed it is metabolized through hydrohexamide which is biologically active and has a half-life of six hours uh, it has uricosuric properties so what does that mean it means that it would increase the uric acid accumulation in the body okay and because of that uh, making it useful in diabetic patients with gout no sorry your uricosuric properties would be elimination of uric acid okay so 
uh, if a diabetic person has a gout as well, gout is this condition that uric acid accumulates within the joints, okay? So, uh, the, this kind of uh, elevation happens here, okay, within the feet. So, uh, the acetohexamide, uh, you know, it releases it, so it will be useful for the person. Then we have intermediate acting agents. So, tolazamide, it is slowly absorbed. It is about five times more potent on a milligram basis. So, it exerts a mild diuretic effect. Then we have glipizide, which is another intermediate acting drug. So, it is rapidly absorbed, but absorption can be delayed by food. It becomes highly protein bound in the insulin. Then we have intermediate acting, uh, which is glyburide. It is rapidly absorbed, inhibits hepatic glucose production exerts a mild diuretic effect. In the long acting, we have uh, sorpromide and glimipiride. So these are rapidly absorbed. These are extensively reabsorbed in the kidney. Reabsorption is slowed under the basic pH. Long acting sulfonyl ureas cause adverse effects more frequently than other sulfonyl ureas. Water retention is common and alcohol consumption produces a disulfiram-like uh, reaction in some patients. What is disulfiram-like reaction in the patient? It is this. You see that if somebody takes an alcohol, okay, so basically the alcohol is converted into alcohol dehydrogenase in the body. Uh, by alcohol dehydrogenase, is being converted into acyl, acetaldehyde. And then it is later on converted into the acetic acid. All right. So, for example, uh, that if somebody has taken this specific medicine, okay. So, what will happen? This enzyme, which is aldehyde dehydrogenase, okay, this is inhibited. And when this is inhibited, so the conversion of a toxic substance, which is acetaldehyde, uh, uh, the, the, will not happen into acetic acid which is less toxic and when this toxic uh, substance which is acetaldehyde will accumulate in the body so as a result these symptoms would happen these symptoms are headache dizziness flushing 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 is the redness of the cheeks okay and then we have uh, and not only just cheeks redness of face okay and then we have abdominal distress and vomiting. Right, everybody? So, this is the disulfiram uh, reaction. And I tell you, there are approximately six classes of medicines which actually, uh, you know, uh, produces this kind of a reaction symptom, okay? So, water retention is common and alcohol consumption produces a disulfiram-like uh, reaction in some patients. These agents are contraindicated in elderly in whom toxicity, toxicities seem to be exacerbated. So therapeutic uses, they are very useful in treating type 2 diabetes, mellitus, but not effective against type 1 diabetes. It should not be used in patients with renal or liver disease. Then we have another class, which is uh, bigonide hyperglycemics, which includes the very famous metformin, okay? So metformin reduces hepatic glucose production and intestinal absorption of glucose. It does not alter insulin secretion. These effects are believed to be due to increase in activity of AMP kinase, a key cellular, intracellular regulator of energy homeostasis. So metformin increases the peripheral uh, insulin sensitivity. Metformin may be used alone or in combination with sulfonylureas or thiazolidinedione. Metformin has been found useful in the treatment of polycystic ovary syndrome. It lowers serum androgen and restores normal menstrual cycles and ovulation. Metformin rarely causes hypoglycemia or weight gain. The adverse effect is lactic acidosis. So, it will increase the amount of lactic acid uh, production, okay, 
by the muscle and of course the fatigue will be developed then we have uh, megdetonite which include repaglinide and metaglinide so these agents are oral insulin uh, secretor gauge that act by blocking the ATP dependent potassium channels on the allosteric side leading to insulin uh, increased insulin secretion by the beta pancreatic cells uh, so netoglide has a more rapid onset of action and is more specific for pancreatic potassium channel than repaglinide these drugs are metabolized by liver and should not be used in patients with hepatic insufficiency the major adverse effect of these drugs is hypoglycemia then we have alpha glucosidase inhibitor which include um, a carbose and miglitol first of all let's this uh, i want to uh, share this slide with you that you see on the small intestine okay they are brush border and on those actually this enzyme wait a minute this enzyme alpha glucosidase is actually present okay so what exactly they do is they convert let's say when you eat the food okay and it is there in your intestine so this enzyme ag converts the oligosaccharides into the monosaccharides and then it is absorbed okay uh, however when we use the inhibitors of this particular enzyme so this conversion is being stopped and when this conversion is stopped as a result uh, the glucose will be eliminated from the body so obviously when a lot of glucose will be eliminated through the body so they there would be side effects associated with it right so a carbose and uh, miglitol are oligosaccharides or oligosaccharide derivatives they act as competitive reversible inhibitors on pancreatic alpha amylase and intestine alpha glucosidase enzyme they act in the lumen of the intestine inhibition of uh, the ag prolongs digestion of carbohydrates and reduces free plasma uh, blood glucose level M uh, miglitol is more potent inhibitor of sucrase and maltase than is acrobose so unlike acrobose miglitol does not inhibit pancreatic alpha myelase but does inhibit isomaltase maltose so these drugs are usually combined with sulfonylurea or other uh, oral hypoglycemic agents so this really causes the hypoglycemia because here we are not dealing with the pancreatic cells okay all right then we have thiazolidine dione okay so when we talk about the structure so first generation compounds include these which we talked so second generation compounds include uh wait a minute all right ignore that slide okay all right so when we talk about uh thai azul uh dione so these are a new class of hypoglycemic agents that act by increasing tissue sensitivity to insulin so these drugs bind to a specific intracellular receptor now this is a nuclear receptor which i talked earlier okay so this drug that is rosiglitazone has about 10 fold higher affinity for ppar uh, gamma than does uh, pioglitazone so by, uh, this uh, predominantly affects liver skeletal muscle and adipose tissue in liver thiolidine dione decrease glucose output and insulin level Wait. in muscle these increase glucose uptake in adipose tissue these drugs increase glucose uptake and decrease fatty acid release and may increase the release of hormone 
it is uh, adi uh, adiponectin and resistin so the action of these drugs require the presence of insulin thiolidinediones reduce plasma glucose and triglycerides so these do not produce hypoglycemia these are associated with exacerbating or causing congestive heart failure then we have intraday mimetics okay so intraday mimetics is a nice hormone which we have in our body okay so what is this do is uh okay so endogenous human intraday such as glucagon like peptide 1 which is also called glp1 are released from the gut and enhance insulin secretion so you see it has other good effects also which are beneficial for us which is not only just this that it decreases the hepatic glucose uh, production but it also delays the gastric emptying okay it causes increase in insulin secretion and it causes decrease in glucagon secretion which is a plus 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 point for us right okay so that is why we are using its mimetics which means that its action would be enhanced more so we have exenatide is a synthetic 39 amino acid glp1 analog then we have liraglutide is longer acting and more resistant to metabolism they also reduce appetite uh, incredence decrease glucagon secretion slow gastric emptying reduce food intake and promote beta cell proliferation subcutaneous injections of incredence may improve glycemic control in patients with type 2 diabetes mellitus who do not uh who have not achieved adequate glycemic control on metformin a sulfonylurea or a combination of metformin and a sulfonylurea pancreatitis has been observed as a serious adverse effect obviously when it will be stimulating both alpha and inhibiting uh, uh, you know it will be it's stimulating the beta and inhibiting alpha Obviously, insulin pancreas would be affected by it, isn't it? Okay. Then we have the bad, bad, bad enzyme, which is dipeptidyl. Uh, it is not that bad, okay? Okay. So this is dipeptidyl peptidase four. So you know what its function is? Its function is to stop this GLP one, okay? Which we talked in our last slide. So in this class, we have Cetagliptin, sesagliptin, linagliptin. These are the members of a class of anti-diabetic agents that act by inhibiting dipeptidyl peptide uh, peptidase four, a serin protease. Okay. So what its function is? This this is responsible for proteolysis of the incretin, including GLP one and glucose dependent insulinotropic peptide. So the 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 enzyme which was good for us which was helping us to maintain a good balance okay it is destroying that okay so what we are doing is we are inhibiting this all right and in order to inhibit this we are taking these medicines so uh dpp4 inhibitors may also improve beta cell function in monotherapy or in combination with metformin DD, DPP4 inhibitors decrease fasting and postprandial plasma glucose concentrations and plasma HbA1c concentration administered orally most common side effects are headache and nausea which are very famous among you students okay then we have a myelin analog so in this class we have framlindide is a synthetic myelin analog a myelin is a polypeptide stored and secreted by the beta cells of the pancreas and it acts in in uh, concert with insulin to reduce the blood glucose sugar okay so it acts to slow gastric emptying decrease glucagon secretion and decrease appetite 
It is administered subcutaneously, typically with insulin. Common side effects, uh, side, common side effects are hypoglycemia and nausea. Okay. Now we'll talk about hyperglycemics. Okay, the agents that are increasing the blood glucose level. So in the first, the first one that we have is glucagon, and then the second one we have di uh, diazocyte. Okay. All right. So glucagon structure and synthesis. Glucagon is a single chain polypeptide of 29 amino acids produced by alpha cells of the pancreas. Glucagon shares a structural hem homology with secretin, VIP, and gastric inhibitory peptide. Secretion of glucagon is inhibited by elevated plasma, glucose, insulin, and somatostatin. Secretion of glucagon is stimulated by amino acid, sympathetic stimulation, and sympathetic secretion. So, the actions and pharmacological properties of glucagon are membrane bound receptors are most abundant in the liver. Response is coupled to increase in CMP levels. So, glucagon stimulates the use of glycogen stores and gluconeogenesis in general. Its action opposes those of insulin. So, insulin was helping us to reduce the blood glucose level. So, this glucagon would actually help us to produce more of the glucose. Okay. So, large doses produce market, uh, marked relaxation of the smooth muscle. Glucagon is extensively degenerated in the liver and kidney and is also subjected to hydrolysis in plasma. So plasma half-life of glucagon is approximately 3 to 5 minutes. Therapeutic uses glucagon produces uh, rescue from... Uh, glucagon actually does the rescue from hypoglycemic crisis. Glucagon rapidly increases the blood glucose in insulin induced hypoglycemia if hepatic glycogen stores are adequate so glucagon provides intestinal relaxation prior to radiologic examination glucagon causes beta cell stimulation of insulin secretion it is used to assess the pancreatic uh, pancreatic reserves the adverse effects are minimal so there is a low incidence of nausea and vomiting. Then we have diazo oxide, diazoxide. So it is a non-diuretic thiazide that promptly increases the blood glucose levels by direct inhibition of the insulin. Okay. So it is useful in cases of insulinoma or Leucine sensitive hypoglycemia. Diazoxide may cause sodium retention, GI irritation, and changes in circulating white blood cells. Thank you, everybody. That is it for today. Great.